When did you start using this? We had a, we got our approval um, in July, and I think our first patient started in August of, two, of 2010. Of 2010, yeah. And so uh, we started with one patient, and when she was our only patient for several weeks, and we finally got number two, um, finally got number three. Then after four and five and six, you know, sort of kind of uh, the talk. We have eight, eight healed. They healed. Mm -hmm. And how are the other ones doing? Very well, very well. We number one, my patient number one is still in the study, and she's the one that started in August, and she's the one that I. She had a very deep wound cavity. She had uh, fallen on a concrete stair and on the, at the edge of a stair on the shin. Very deep. Um, started out as bruising and ow. That really hurt a lot. I'm glad I didn't break my leg kind of thing. And down the road a ways before she realized that she had more extensive and deep tissue injury there. She is so nearly close right now. Uh, 0 0.3 by 0 0.2 by, you know, just the, that top layer of skin missing. And uh, so just very nearly there. Can you describe the patients that you, you're, you're working with? Most of them are older um, and older over 65. Um, I do have one that is young, um, 50, 52 maybe, <clears throat> but generally they're older. Most of them, not all, but most of them have diabetes. Most of them, but not all of them, have had chronic long-term wounds. Um, we've had wounds that we've worked with now that have been um, present for nearly three years. Um, Lower extremity wounds, we're only looking at venous stasis ulcers, and those are below the knee. What Pre is a venous stasis ulcer? Venous stasis, um, when you have poor circulation below the knee, remember below the knee you have smaller vessels, and aging and diabetes uh, just wreaks havoc on your vessels anyway, especially with the diabetes, that, and those vessels are damaged to the point where uh, they don't really function appropriately. So below the knee, you have the smaller vessels, they're damaged, they're not functioning properly. So you have fluid that stays in the low leg longer than it should. So the arteries bring the blood flow down, and with the beat of the heart, then we pump it back through the, the veins. And so these veins that aren't pumping back right for some reason, it's either the vessel walls themselves have been so congested and full of fluid that they've stretched out like a balloon would. And so the valves in the legs now, when the heart pumps, they open up, blood flows up, they, the heart rests, they close, the valves close. Now we've stretched out the vessels so the fluid goes up and kind of regurgitates back in there because of gravity. And if the fluid stays in the vessels, they become so overwhelmed that it changes actually the gradient, the pressure gradient inside the vessel and starts leaking out into the tissue and kind of third spacing kind of thing. So you it's have like a, a hydrostatic pressure. Yeah. So. Yeah. So you have a lot of edema in these lower extremities. And that swelling, that fluid, that extra fluid that builds up down there wants a way out. So often it, you know, I think about this, it stretches the tissue till it's at its thinnest. And then often you'll just crack and weep. Wound fluid or body fluid has a lot of enzymes in that enzymatic action of cleaning, you know, they're cleaners. And so that will actually eat away at the tissue on the surface of the wound, especially if you've got a Band-Aid or something over it or even your clothing can hold it next to the skin and it kind of erodes away the skin. And over a long term you get a wound that just kind of keeps on going on because it won't quit weeping long enough to heal. And so either that or some minor incident, like uh, most of the folks that I see got a wound from some minor incident. It's like, I just bumped my leg on a plastic cart in the garage and it just, you know, three years ago and it hasn't healed. And I hear that story over and over. And so they're little wounds that are of no consequence except for they never heal. And of course, a hole in you is an invitation to bacteria and infection. Diabetes loves infection, and they just feed each other. What, can you give me a sense of the, the scale of the wounds when you're talking about a wound? Well, you're going to have a wound that's anywhere from a centimeter by a centimeter by less than a tenth of a centimeter deep. 
that just get stuck there and so don't. So that's like about the size of a just, dime? Uh, maybe. The, by the pinky finger, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, very small wounds to wounds that uh, we have three or four in the study that are wounds that if they didn't have debris in them, I'm sure you would see some serious structure like bone. We see tendon bone, uh, nerve strands, vessels. And so, you know, they're quite extensive wounds or can be. And it's, again, it's because they go on and on and on. Okay, now you have this glass product. How, can you walk me through the steps? What, how does it come to you and what do yeah. you do with it with a typical patient? It comes to me pre-sterilized and packaged. You want to have a nice, clean, moist wound before you start, if you can. And as clean as you can get it before you start. Um, and, and I just use tweezers and depending on where the wound is, sometimes you just kind of have to pour it out in your hand and, you know, put it up there. But um, because it isn't a flat foil pack, you, it kind of comes kind of squished down and it looks much like um, cotton candy. If I have a, a wound that has a cavity or tunneling, then I will take the, those tweezers and we'll, I'll just kind of pack it up into the cavities and to the the crevices back there before I fill up the wound cavity. I try to always fill the cavity. I don't pack it in hard and tamp it or anything like that, but I do try, especially if I have tunneling or uh, deep recesses, we do try to get it back in there as much as we can. And what I've been doing is, in the past I'd always wanted to breed anything out that didn't look good. Any slough or anything that looked non-viable, I wanted to clean that away. But what I found with this product is that I can actually leave that. Uh, and removing it sometimes can be a trick because it actually feels like it makes its own little environment and it causes, it's almost like a tightly woven web of tissue and product. And I felt like some of it is well adhered. If it is, I try not to disturb it. Um, leftover debris of it will look like wet sand and usually be at the low end and uh, anything that looks like that I'll try to flush it or um, irrigate it out of the wound bed but anything that wants to hang on and grip on what I have seen is that sort of that little beginning matrix maybe uh, we don't really know at this point what it is that it's doing there but it seems okay to leave it there and what I will see often is that the next time you're going to start seeing granulation tissue in that area. Now eventually I don't see that anymore so it gives it up. Does it become part of the tissue? We don't quite know really what the whole um, story is there but it's just such a neat thing to watch that process. And then usually a secondary dressing over it, a gauze and a wrap. Uh, like I said, we're, we're talking lower extremity wounds and the gold standard for venous stasis ulceration is compression wraps. And so I'd say 75% mm, of the folks I have have enough edema that we do put them in compression, a una boot wrap or a multiple layered wrap. So depending on the size of the wound, the activity of the patient, where they're located, how far their drive is to clinic, I'll see them uh, once a week, twice a week, three times a week at the most. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Friday, or one of those days. I try to not see them too often. My personal um, theory is that you can mess with the wound so much that uh, you don't give it an opportunity to heal. And uh, daily and more than daily wound dressing changes, I feel like, are probably as... Um, detrimental as they are helpful. How do you know the wound wouldn't have healed anyway? Oh, I'm sure it would have. I'm, my gut says it would have healed. Um, I feel like before we started using this product, I had wounds that healed um, at the same rate that we're healing now. What I think, though, is amazing is that it's allowing me to do s two wounds that I have on the study. I would have chosen a wound vac as my plan A, or at least plan B, if what I did up front wasn't showing me the progress that I wanted to see. And I don't know if you know about wound vacs, but it's a negative pressure. It's a little machine that you carry around with you and it sort of vacuum packs your wound. And it's a beautiful thing and it grows, it, it will produce granulation tissue at a high rate of speed. 
double time of what normal uh, wound healing would be. What I am finding is though is with this glass fiber product that I'm building granulation tissue and filling that wound bed at the same kind of rate of speed that I would expect from a wound back, which is very expensive and an aggravation um, because though they've made it small enough that it's not a big deal to carry around with you all the time, we're talking a dressing and a little machine that's with you 24 seven from the time you get started with it until the wound is healed. And don't get me wrong, I'm a major fan of the wound back, but uh, if I can see that tissue healing at the same rate or nearly even the same rate, then I'm, I'm liking that a lot. I, well, when, the, when the wound is healed, what does it appear like? It's a, amazing. With it, we're seeing so little scar tissue there. Patient number one had a significant wound and it was like a big number six shape. And now there's a tiny little spot there. But when you look at that area, if you didn't know that wound was there, you would never say, oh, that's where she hurt herself. Because the scarring is just not there. Um, this looks like that even though it's a slower process of forming that epithelial cover, that evidently um, whatever magic is, it's building a better structure. And again, our folks are elderly and they have a lot of skin discoloration and you would think that you're going to see more dramatic scarring. And seriously, we have, scar we have healed wounds that show you nothing. Wound care specialists like to have a lot of tools. Yeah. At their so yeah. this is one more. It is, it is. It's a, it's a wonderful tool to have. And you know, my, I was taught that you start conservatively and you build up. If the conservative uh, care doesn't work, then you move forward with something that's a little more advanced or a little more expensive and you know, you work your way to that. Um, but I will work my way to that very quickly because you know, I do want to see good results and I want, and I'm, I'm not patient. I don't think so. I want to see those results happen. I want to see them happen timely and I know that I can use this product and I can see those deep wounds um, progress quickly. And so I think that um, in that sense I am a little bit biased because I would prefer to reach for a product that I know I can see some magic happen quickly as opposed to seeing it happen and trying to get your photographs together to compare them to see what's happening here. You know, where, when, you, when your eyes can tell you, wow, um, that's a nice big change since the last time I saw it. And you don't have to go back and refer to the last six weeks worth of uh, photographs to see in my building tissue there. What's your patient's impression of it? They love it.